hella high water. Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Some people think, you know, that, that I may speak so well that I can do this. No, no, no. You don't understand the fear and the trepidation with which I approach ministry. You, don't, you have no idea how desperately dependent that I am on him. It's just that I trust him. I so trust him. I trust him. I just trust him that God, you know, I, I know what it is like to see men with marvelous words of man's wisdom and understanding and fall on their face. That you can be a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal with your little witty uh, quotes and your little rhyming stuff and there be no life in it and people uh, are, are, are dry and, and dead. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm so desperately dependent on God. I'm so dependent on God and I'm like, God, this, this is your thing. I mean, the Bible says, and these signs shall follow them that believe and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why would I stress myself out saying, you know, well, what if they don't recover after I lay my hands on it? Well, that's not, you know, you know, when we have faith, we pray the prayer of faith and the Bible says, and the Lord shall raise them up. It is not even my responsibility to raise them up. I just lay my hands in faith and God does the raise. That's his, that's on God. That's on God. That is not my responsibility to raise anybody up. I'm not God. I'm his servant. I'm, I'm his instrument. And so if, if, they, if they didn't get up, it's, it's not a reflection on me. I'm like, God, this, this is your department. I'm, I'm not a miracle worker. You're the miracle worker. It's your power. It is your glory. Whatever glory comes out of this, this glory belongs to you, Jesus. This belongs to who you are. And so I, I just, I'm, I'm so desperately dependent on God. So that there are some things that we do in, in dealing with stress that you need to prepare your body. Your body has to be prepared through exercise and diet. Okay. See, with your own body, exercise and diet, exercise and diet. You've been eating bad foods. You, your body doesn't handle stress well. And you can break down. Did you know that some people smoke because they're nervous? and that they're stressed out, they have anxiety, but you know what? Smoking cigarettes destroys B vitamins in your body. The B vitamins help you to deal with stress. And so you're damaging yourself from being able to even have the natural thing that the body is designed to do to be able to help you to deal with stress. So you have to have diet and exercise. You get stressed out, go for a walk. Go for a jog, exercise, go, go work out in the gym. You can actually burn off much of your anxiety. It's a good thing for individuals to do, particularly, you know, if you're a person prone to, to violence. You know, there are violent women nowadays. You know, you need to go to the gym and work out too. <laughs> women beat the men up, you know, they all just keep looking straight ahead, you know. <laughs> but you have to have balance in the area of your body. The second area is your emotions emotions you know there are certain stress uh, reduction exercises that I believe that you do emotionally you have to talk to yourself you know like simmer down simmer your five six seven eight nine you have to have whatever little whatever trick works for you whatever trick works for you you know you have to know what you need to do in order to calm yourself down you don't want to get home and just say what in the world did I just do Lord, I wonder if I call them back and I get my job back. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you don't want to do that because you have reacted. You want to be able to have some stress reduction exercise of whether it means that you just need to just stop and breathe deeply. Just stop and breathe deeply. That you have this picture in your mind of a favorite place that really takes you away and that relaxes you. And you just go to that special place in your mind. Even while people are talking to you and blessing you out, you just go to that special place. Have your, your own special stress reduction exercises that you do. And then there are certain things that you do as far as your spirit is concerned. I believe that he's given us some things here when he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything notice by prayer by prayer and supplication now you know now supplication is some of the stuff that we do as we pray now people crying you know that's a part of supplicating it's part of supplicating do you know you have a good cry you actually feel better afterwards you if you get really with God and just start praying and supplicating these are things that you add to that prayer, whether you're flailing yourself around, whatever your supplication is. You actually will feel better 
afterwards through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving I believe that he tells us with thanksgiving because this brings us back into proper perspective proper perspective that I may be having some bad things here but you know what I've got some things for which to be thankful notice with thanksgiving let your request be made known because when you do that you, you use your prayer your supplication and your thanksgiving and notice what will happen the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus to guard you see they are not always major issues that actually stress us out but they are the little annoyances of life that actually build up anger rejection uh, interruptions you ever talk to somebody and you know every time you're trying to get something out somebody it's interrupting you there's interruptions this can cause stress in you it's like if they interrupt me one more time broken appointments you ever had somebody that you were waiting on and then they just never showed up it, you know you know that it, it causes anxiety in us it causes stress um, the, our, the inescapable telephone uh, did you know bad weather causes stress in us bad weather God knows traffic does it we have any witnesses to traffic how traffic can affect you did you know that there, there is mental training that they actually do in sports when you're working with an athlete and it has four goals when they do mental training to help them to be moderate and temperate anxious for nothing you know what their, their four goals that they deal with an athlete number one is to motivate the athlete they do mental training to motivate the athlete like you can do this you can do this sometimes you have to just tell yourself you can make it through this just keep your mouth shut just just you can make it through this you can make it through this and so it's just to motivate the athlete motivate secondly is to develop the athletes concentration and focus to develop the athletes concentration and focus they do mental exercise to develop their concentration and their focus ability number three they do it to build the athletes confidence to build the athletes confident mental condition you're a winner we're a winner we're gonna take this game you know you know, just fired up. You know, that's the way that Muhammad Ali used to come out. Just, I mean, you know, just, just shooting off at the mouth, building his own confidence and intimidating his opponent. And number four, they, did, they would do mental exercises to show the athlete how to manage stress, how to manage stress. Sometimes it's a tactic for some athletes to actually say insulting things, talk about somebody's mama to get them angry because that breaks their focus and concentration. If they, somebody says something to then make them want to fight, they have just broken your, your focus and, and concentration and then they can work on defeating you. So, I mean, how do you manage your stress? I mean, how do you personally manage your stress, your anxiety? When he says be anxious, for nothing when you have told the children to have this mess cleaned up by the time you get home and you get home and find stuff everywhere still in the same place stuff is not done and uh, you, you you go into a moment of anxiety didn't I tell you <laughs> unmanaged stress can spin a person out of control and into sin and did you know that stress causes relapses back into addictive behaviors? There are so many people, if they've been delivered from alcohol, drugs, sex addiction, when you come under stress, there is a strong, strong temptation to cause you to have a relapse and go back into that same behavior out of which you've come because it's a comfort zone for us and and this is the thing that helps some people so-called cope but that's an unhealthy way of coping It's when it sends you back into addictive behaviors but that's what what it does but remember that T.L. Uh, Collier uh, he said never do what you cannot ask Christ to bless never do what you can't ask Christ to bless now if you can't ask Jesus to bless this and you don't have to wonder, don't, don't do it. And never go any place or in any pursuit that you cannot ask Christ Jesus to go with you. 
Now he's given us a litmus test. Whatever you can't ask Christ to bless. Did you know in 1996, 99% of family doctors said that spirituality makes a significant contribution to physical health. 99% of family doctors said that spirituality makes a significant contribution to physical health. The bottom line is that we have to be balanced. Do you know Hosea chapter 7 and verse 8? You know what it says? It says that Ephraim, you remember Ephraim and Manasseh? These were the tribes of Israel, Ephraim. It's one of uh, Joseph's children, so it's that tribe that came off from him. He said, Ephraim is like a cake that is not turned. Now you know the Brahma translation. Half-baked. In other words, you're only done on one side. You're off balance. You're only done on one side. Ephraim is a cake not turned. You're, you're half-baked. And so you're, you're only done on one side. And so we have to be done on both sides. You, you, you want it done all the way through, don't you? You don't want gooey stuff on the bottom. So uh, it's a cake not turned. In, in, in other words, it's time to flip over so you can get the other side done. That there's a balance to this thing. That there's certain things that we might have worked on and we might have gotten our spiritual life in order. But you know what? Our finances might be totally out of whack. And we've got to work in that area. And, and for, for another person, it might be their physical body because their diet is jacked up. Uh, they don't even exercise, and they're just an accident waiting to happen. So he's saying, check yourself and make sure that you've not just gone and gotten yourself where you're really on point in every area on this side. He says, Ephraim is a cake not turned. It's, it, you're half-baked. And he says, you've got to be done on the other side. That we've we've got to be done on the other side you know so that there's a way that God has to uh, get us done on the other side because balance is, is is the key to life it is being able to have a balance this is what gives us a wonderful wonderful uh, perspective uh, to the world of what God is like there's a balance between Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God they they each present a balance to us but you come here for just a moment and and, and help me I, I just want to Maybe just illustrate some things that it may relate to. Come, come right up here. And let's say that, just hang on to that. That this, let's say that we have a connection. We have a connection and we, we're bound together in this connection by this. But you see, let's say that we've gone through some situations and things have gotten tense between us. And you notice how this cord now is straight out. It's, it's, it's really tense. You notice there's tension in the relationship. Now there are a couple of ways of dealing with tension that come in the relationship in order to have balance. Who wants to live in tension? He says, listen, let your moderation be known unto all men, but he says what? Be anxious for nothing. Anxiety produces tension in a relationship. If you're anxious, husband and wife, and then they start snapping with each other, you know the first thing that happens when uh, spouses become anxious one with another or just another person stressed out they they upset with you guess what they tell you don't what <laughs> don't touch me don't touch me they, and they they pull their shoulder away because there's tension in the relationship now how do you get the tension out of the relationship the way that you get the tension out, now I can get the tension out a couple of ways. I can give more cord to the relationship and I have just relieved the pressure of tension on the relationship. Now we have it because I have created distance by giving more cord to the relationship. And so individuals will begin to emotionally distance themselves so that when he does this or when she does that, I am no longer climbing the wall because they have created emotional distance. But the real thing and beauty of relationship is intimacy. Say intimacy. Into me see. 
It's allowing the person to really be close. And if they're going to be able to see into you, they've got to be fairly close to you. So when you give more distance to the relationship by lengthening the cord, you have just done a disservice. I mean, yeah, you got the tension off, but now you guys are not even close with one another, and there's an element of bitterness that's in your heart. And you get upset with a business partner, somebody that you go into a deal with, some, somebody who's just a friend of yours, and you guys were in a situation where your relationship was very tense. And then, you know what? You stop calling them as much. You don't text them as much. You all don't hang out anymore. And what you've done is that you have lengthened the cord in terms of the connection, the tie that you have together. You've lengthened it. But now here's the other way to be able to get the tension off of the cord is to move closer. See, when you come closer with each other, I have just, see, when we're apart, we've got tension in our relationship. And, and here's the deal, we as human beings can actually get off balance and then get mad in our relationship with God and we've got a strain tensious relationship with God and the only way to get rid of the tension that you have with God is to draw nigh when you draw nigh he says you draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you I'll get rid of the tension when you come closer to me all of that your toxic emotions will begin to melt out of your life just draw near to me and I'll get the tension off and so we've got individuals who've got a connection with God but now they are upset because their mama died because they prayed and they still lost their job and now there's tension in the relationship because God told you that something was going to happen and it hasn't happened by a certain time you put him on a deadline and now you've got tension in your relationship with God and God's saying I want you to come back into balance with me I don't like the tension that's between us and the answer is not to give God more more uh, distance because now you won't pray and so you won't even talk to him, you won't answer his calls, you won't read his letter to you. And so, uh, that, and, and so you've created now the slack on the cord because you have lengthened the cord by adding distance to your relationship when God simply wanted you to draw nigh. And you will get all of the tension off of the cord. He's saying, draw nigh unto me, draw near, draw me nearer, nearer, nearer to thee. Just draw nigh unto me. You draw nigh unto God, and God will draw nigh unto you, and you'll get rid of the tension. That's about balance. It is about balance. And so if we've got a relationship, and tension comes on our relationship, when you really get angry with each other, that is the time to draw near with each other, not to turn away, not to pull your shoulders away, and then you look to one side of the bed, and they on the other side of the bed. It's the time to actually draw near and you'll take all of the tension off the relationship. Thank you so much. You will be surprised just how interesting it is that when God has done something in your life of how you can simply find the balance in it. And I want to say it to you this way that in terms of finding the balance in life I want you to think of it like a glass of lemonade you ever been to a place and your lemonade was just too tart see there are certain ingredients there but they must be in balance and if you don't have the right balance of lemon juice and the right balance of sugar and the right balance of water then your lemonade is not going to be right isn't it terrible to go someplace and, and, and order some fresh squeezed lemonade and you, you have it that it's going to be so wonderful and refreshing and then you, you drink it and it's, it, it makes you grimace because it's so tart because the amount of lemon juice in it is off balance? Or you go and it's really like real, real sweet red Kool-Aid <laughs> and you realize that there was too much sugar in it and it's sort of weak because it doesn't have enough lemon juice and now it is off balance or have you ever had it where there was the concentration was just too strong and and uh, 
they had too much lemon and too much sugar and not enough water and the stuff is just too concentrated it's almost like syrup and you didn't have the proper balance of water but if you get the proper balance of water and the proper balance of sugar and the proper balance of the lemon now the beverage can become wonderfully refreshing to you life is about balance and what God does is that he takes sour situations and he gives us sweet situations and then there is the water of the Spirit the water of life that comes and God knows just the right balance to be able to refresh you and there are always times of refreshing in the presence of God and it is not until you're in the water of the Spirit that God fills you up with the proper amount of water to dilute all of the sour lemony stuff that life has dealt us and the sugary stuff the accolades the flowery words that other people have spoken to us these things things mean nothing to us except we have the water of the spirit which is life in us there is a life that comes from God. May I just tell you that uh, when you begin to speak certain kinds of words, that there's a balance to the kinds of words that you speak. You don't just speak all of any one kind of word. Uh, may I just tell you that number one, you speak God's word. It's what God said. You know, that's what praise is, homologio. It is saying the same thing with your mouth that God has said in his word. It is giving God his word back. We have to be able to speak God's word. That's why you have to get God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. You use God's words. That there are certain things that have to come, and it comes exclusively because these are God's words. Secondly, you have to be able to speak prophetic words. Prophetic words are words of life, hear me carefully, words of life for your future. They are life, speaking life to your future. Prophetic words. Whenever you speak prophetic things, these words have life in them. They quicken something on the inside of you. They strike your spirit, and, but they speak to your future that you're not always going to be in this particular position. So we have to learn to speak prophetic words. That's why the Bible says to covet, to prophesy. So you can speak life to somebody. You begin to speak to their future, not just about what's going on right now. You speak to where they're going. You speak to their future. And then there are vision words. Whenever you are caught up in what, where you are right now and everything that you're dealing with, you have to speak words. That's why he says write the vision so that he can read it and run with it. So you have to speak your vision words. What is it that God told me that I was going to be doing? Go back and remind yourself of the vision, the vision. Go back to the vision, to the vision, to the vision that God has given you. Go back to the vision, go back to the vision, go back to the vision. And then there are, there are words that are, that are faith words, where faith calls those things that be not as though they were. It doesn't call things that are as though they are not. And so we have to be able to speak faith words, faith words, faith words. You begin to speak the word of God that I, with his stripes I am healed, that he sent his word and healed me and delivered me from my destruction. You begin to speak faith words that I am blessed in my coming in. Speak faith words that the favor of God rests upon my life, that my household is blessed, my children are blessed, my spouse is blessed. You begin to speak wonderful things, that good things are coming to me today, that wonderful things are flowing into my life this week. You'll be surprised what will happen when you begin to speak, to call those things that be not as though they were. This is a part of learning how with your mouth to pray the answer and not the problem. God already knows the problem. You begin to pray the answer. You begin to speak, let your request be made known unto him. Don't talk about the problem. Just tell God what you need. Let your request be made known unto God and then then the God of peace will begin to fill you. And then you need to learn to speak, fifthly, grace words. Let your speech be seasoned with grace. There's a grace that comes from God to be able, th these are kind words, these are words that bless others, these are words of encouragement. Where your, your, your mouth is a wellspring of life and you're blessing others and you are encouraging others and you are edifying others you're finding something positive that a person has done and bringing acknowledgement to it do you know that whenever you feel positive things toward a person and you don't take the time to express that it is like wrapping a gift and never giving it but when you have grace words 
that are in your mouth. You begin to speak concerning the things positively that other individuals are doing and say, you know what, you did a wonderful job in that play. To say, you know what, that was a great song that you led. You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much for handling your business so well. When I'm on the plane and I have flight attendants that have served with excellence, I speak to that. I bring acknowledgement to that. When I'm in a restaurant and a, a waitress, a waiter has served well, I, I, I acknowledge that. Thank you for serving with excellence. You do your job so well. You've made my experience that much more pleasurable just by the way in which you have served today. Thank you so much. And I'll bring acknowledgement to them. Just grace words, just grace words. You're a marvelous mother. You've done an outstanding job with your children. These are not lies. These are where you're looking and you're seeing things that people are doing right. Because you'd be surprised so few people will ever tell you anything that you do right and the first time that you do something wrong, a half a dozen people will point it out. Grace words that will just compliment you and say, your hair looks nice today. Your clothes are awfully neat. Just grace words. Just grace. Just, just grace. Where you're, you're, you, you become those that will bring grace to everyone that hears you. You bring grace to the hearers. And there's a soothing that just comes from your words that even there might be something traumatic that might have happened to somebody and when they hear your voice a confidence in God should come to, to know that you know what everything's gonna be alright it's gonna be alright baby you're gonna make it through this you're gonna be fine in your exam baby you're gonna make it through this thank you for watching power for living with Bishop Dale C Bronner until next time God bless you